I would like to start off by thanking everybody for giving me the opportunity to present, for letting me participate in the Philosophy Club. Uh, my name is Matthew Dunn. I am a sociology professor here. I see some familiar faces, so that's pretty nice. And today I will be talking about research I conducted for my dissertation at UCR on the organismic analogy in sociology. And so, I'd just like to give you a, a brief outline before we get started. Some of the things I'll talk about today are first, I want to start out by talking about why should we be interested in the organismic analogy in the first place. This is an idea that you'll probably hear about in the intro to sociology course, you'll hear about it in the theory course, and then you'll never hear about it for the rest of your time as a sociologist. So I really want to talk about why we might bring the organismic analogy back. Then I'll cover the rise and the fall of the organismic analogy in sociology. I'll talk a little bit about what organisms are and how we can use some contemporary evolutionary theory to try to redefine our definition of organisms. And then after all of that, that background, I'll hopefully paint a picture of organisms in which you agree uh, that societies can be considered as social organisms. And so to start out, why should we try to revive the organismic analogy? Well, in our modern consumer-oriented society, many of us are inflicted with a bias a bias that can be referred to as neomania. Right? So think about the stuff that we like. We tend to like new things. Right? We tend to prefer new things to things that are old. And this is something that isn't unique to us in society. This is a, a bias that really afflicts social scientists. Right? If you read ASR, if you read AJS, if you read any of the journals in sociology, you'll see that we're very infatuated with new ideas. If an idea is newer, we assume that that idea is better. But that idea, that bias of neomania, runs counter to another idea known as the Lindy effect. And the Lindy effect is a heuristic you can use to think about the longevity of non-perishable entities. Right? So some entities, non-organic entities like ideas or cultural products, don't perish. The Lindy effect is a recognition that for many cultural entities, the longer that entity has been, been around, the longer it will be around. Right? Think about this in terms of music. A lot of what's on the radio today won't be on the radio a year from now, two years from now. Right? But what about music like the Beatles? We've been listening to the Beatles for, what, 50, 60 years now. It's likely that far into the future we'll still be listening to the Beatles. And so in some regards, ideas that are older have more staying power. And so we shouldn't just discount the organismic analogy because it's an idea that sociologists talked about in 1870 and haven't talked about since 1915. The fact that it's an old idea might actually demonstrate that there's something there we should take seriously. Another reason to think about the organismic analogy is the unificationist account of scientific explanation. Right? I know there are a lot of philosophers in this room, so I wanted to throw some philosophy of science out there for you. There's many philosophers of science who have really tried to assess what is the goal of science? What makes a good scientific theory? A lot of our scientific theories focus on causal mechanistic knowledge. We want to try to find some sort of causal relationship and try to understand the cause underlying a different phenomenon. And while that's good, why that helps us grow our state of knowledge, there's benefit to investigating ideas that can try to unify phenomenon that we see as separate. And so one benefit of the organismic analogy is you can try to use this analogy to create a general set of principles that applies across the, the domain of entities that exist in the world. Right? If we can come up with a set of rules or a set of relationships that pertain to both social bodies and organic bodies, there's some benefit to that unification. And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, biologists are doing it. Sociologists talked about the organismic analogy for 50 or 60 years and then stopped. As sociologists have stopped talking about the organismic analogy, biologists have started talking about the organismic analogy. And so sociologists can't just ignore this conversation. This is a conversation that is taking place in academia. If sociologists don't contribute to our understanding of society as an organism, we risk, we risk missing out on this larger academic conversation. And so if sociologists ignore the idea that societies can be organismic, we'll do so at our own peril because other sciences, specifically biologists, are talking about the organismic analogy 
And if we cede that conversation to biologists, then sociologists have really missed out in a, a key area of the world in which I think the sociological perspective can contribute. And so with that background, I want to talk a little bit about the organismic analogy in sociology. We'll first talk about the rise of the organismic analogy. And so the organismic analogy was really a key component of sociology during the classical era. If you're not a sociologist, you might wonder what is the classical era of sociology? Is that like 500 BC? Um, no, the classical era of sociology would be from about like 1870 to around 1930 or so. Right? That's really the, the time period where sociology was coming into its own as a discipline. That's really the time period where sociology first started to emerge as a discipline. And in that early emergence of sociology, the organismic analogy was a key component to not only sociological theory, but to justifying sociology as a science in and of itself. We can talk about Auguste Comte, who uh, was born in France in 1798 and died in 1857. And Comte is widely regarded as kind of the father of sociology. Comte was the first European sociology, sociologer, sociologer, <laughs> sociologist, right? But with, with Comte, what he was trying to do was justify a new way of thinking about the social world. Comte grew up in an incredibly chaotic time. He was born right at the tail end of the French Revolution, and he lived through a number of different political upheavals. Not only was Comte living in a chaotic society, Comte's personal life was full of chaos. When he was a young man, an adolescent, he had a falling out with his parents. His parents threw him out of the house. He was taken in by the, the French socialist philosopher saint Simon. Eventually, he had a falling out with saint Simon, was thrown out of saint Simon's house, fell in love. Shortly after falling in love, his relationship went awry, fell in love again. It was the love of his life, and after about a year of marriage, the love of his life died from tuberculosis. And so Comte was living in a chaotic time period, and he had an incredibly chaotic life himself. Because of that, Comte was really motivated to try to use science to bring order to the social universe. Comte said, think about what science does. Science brings order to a world of chaos. When, the, when physicists come up with knowledge about physics, they're bringing order to the realm of matter. When biologists come up with knowledge about, about life, they're bringing order to this biological realm. In the same way, if sociologists want to bring order to the social realm, we need to try to build a science of society. One way that we can do that is by piggybacking off of the success of biology. Comte had a very specific view of the relationship between the sciences. For Comte, there was a progressive development of science in the history of humanity. Right? The first science for Comte was astronomy. As astronomy reached a mature stage, physics would emerge. As physics reached a mature stage, chemistry took the fore. As chemistry reached a mature stage, biology took the fore. During Comte's time period, there were tremendous advances in our knowledge of biology, and Comte took those advances as signifying the fact that biology was now a mature science, and it was time for sociology to take the reins from biology. So Comte would try to invoke the metaphor of a society as an organism to try to justify the science of sociology by piggybacking off of the successes of biology. Biology had been remarkably successful in taking a holistic perspective to life and studying life from a holistic perspective. Comte thought we could do the same thing by studying society as an organism. And lastly, there was a religious element to it for Comte. As Comte was growing up, he was lamenting the downfall of religion in French society. And for Comte, this was a problem because religion was the skin of the social body. Comte said, if we're going to make the organismic analogy, we can say that towns and cities are the organs of the social body, and that religion is the skin that holds these organs together. Well, as Comte perceived the downfall of religion in French society, he thought we needed to create a religion of humanity that could substitute the religions of old. What could be the entity of devotion for this religion of humanity, this new religion that Comte thought he could start? Well, it could be the social body, the social organism. And so not only did the organismic analogy justify the existence of sociology based on Comte's understanding of the relationship of the sciences, it also served as 
a new god for the religion of humanity that Comte saw himself, saw himself forming. Along with Comte, another sociologist who made the organismic analogy was Herbert Spencer from England, uh, born in 1820 and who died in 1903. Now if you take an intro to sociology course, you're not likely to talk about Spencer because of the association between Spencer and social Darwinism. But during Spencer's life, he was considered one of the, the foremost uh, scientists of his day. And a lot of this is due to his work with the synthetic philosophy. Spencer didn't just see himself as a sociologist or as a philosopher. Spencer really saw himself as a polymath, as an expert on everything. And so Spencer wanted to create a 10-volume set where he created a set of first principles and then applied those principles to the realm of biology, to the realm of psychology, to the realm of sociology, and to the realm of ethics, to the realm of morality. Right? So the first document of the synthetic philosophy was Spencer's attempt to deduce a set of first principles that could be used to explain the interrelationships between all forms of matter. The first principle of his first principles was this principle of evolution. And Spencer's principle of evolution, even though his idea of evolution is different than what we now regard as Darwinian evolution, Spencer's principle of evolution was really the, background, the backbone for his, or, for his organismic analogy. So for Spencer, all of life is shaped by this process of evolution. All of life is shaped by pressures which are leading to an aggregation of matter, the progressive differentiation of that matter, so as groups come together, individuals in that group or entities in that group take on different roles. And then through that differentiation, that group would become an integrated unit. And so for Spencer, evolution was this process where aggregates of matter would come together. And then through a process of progressive differentiation and integration, those aggregates of matter would become their own form of entity. Spencer would apply this principle of evolution to both organic entities, bodies, and superorganic entities, societies, to argue that there are parallel principles of organization that shape the structure of both animal bodies and of human societies. So by applying his principle of evolution to organic and superorganic matter, to animals and societies, Spencer said there must be some common set of principles that structures the way these bodies are. And those common principles for Spencer were that increases in size would necessarily lead to increasing differentiation. And then through that differentiation of structure and function, a new, more cohesive, integrated unit would be produced. And so for Spencer, both organisms and human societies were structured by this relationship, where increasing size leads to increasing differentiation, which through that differentiation produces an integrated system. The last sociologist to really make a substantive contribution to our organismic analogy is Emile Durkheim. And Emile Durkheim, although arg arguably the sociologist who had the most well-respected and most famous version of the organismic analogy, is one of the main contributors to the downfall in of the organismic analogy in the history of sociology due to the way he reinterpreted the organismic analogy um, as a functional rather than an evolutionary analogy. So for Spencer, the similarities between societies and organisms was an opportunity to better understand our idea of evolution. And for Durkheim, that was initially the case with the organismic analogy. He came up with a theory of social change where theories were go where societies were going from units based on similarity to units based on a progressive differentiation and integration of parts. And so very early on in his career, Durkheim made an organismic analogy that was very similar to Spencer's. But as he would progress through his career, he would abandon that evolutionary focus, and his organismic analogy would take on a more functional air. So with his, his publication of the rules of the sociological method, Durkheim started to focus on what he called the normal and the pathological elements of society. And in making the, the distinction between normal and pathological elements of society, Durkheim was likening a society to an organism. An organism can have normal functions and it can have pathological functions. Right? For Durkheim, part of the organismic analogy was to essentially be doctors of society, 
assess what's a normal element of society, what needs to be there for social functioning, and distinguish, distinguish what elements of society are pathological and that need to be excised, that need to be cut out of society. And so Durkheim took the organismic analogy and altered it from an evolutionary analogy to a more functional analogy. Right? With Durkheim, the organismic analogy really lost its evolutionary focus. He abandoned the, evolu the organismic analogy from early on in his career and started to focus on the pathological elements of society. How can we assess what institutions are normal, what institutions cause social dysfunction, social problems, and then try to rid ourselves of those institutions? Well, it's this shift towards a functional version of the organismic analogy that really led to the downfall of the organismic analogy in the early 20th century in sociological theory. Right, so throughout the 20th century, sociologists progressively became less and less interested in this idea that a society is an organism. If you go to graduate school in sociology, you'll spend probably one week of your entire graduate training entertaining the idea that a society is an organism before you throw that idea to the recycling bin and never think about it again uh, until you're confronted with my dissertation. <laughs> but what really led to the downfall of the organismic analogy in American sociology? Well, I would argue that it's because of the influence of two different classical sociological theorists, Karl Marx, who many of you might claim as a philosopher, we claim as a, as a sociologist. Right? But Karl Marx, throughout the 1960s, became more and more influential in American sociology. Right, many of Marx's works were translated into English in the first, for the first time in the early 20th century. As more of Marx's works became translated into English, American scholars became more knowledgeable about many of Marx's more philosophical writings. And as the societal upheavals of the 1960s really highlighted the presence of conflict in society, many sociologists became completely disenchanted with the dominant functional paradigm. Disenchanted with the dominant functional paradigm, disenchanted with the consensus view of society that was put forth by sociologists such as Talcott Parsons, many sociologists turned towards Marx and started to develop a, a, a new conflict theory for sociology. Right? As sociologists turned to conflict theory, they really turned away from anything that could be considered functional sociology. Sociologists argued that looking at the societal upheavals that were taking place all around the world in the 1960s, there was just way too much social conflict for the consensus view of society, for the harmonious view of society that was implied by seeing a society as an organism. Right? So as Marx became more prominent in sociology, sociologists became less and less interested in the organismic analogy. But it wasn't just Marx who would lead to the downfall of the organismic analogy in sociology. It was also Max Weber. Max Weber, perhaps more than any sociologist, has influenced the, the structure and the theories that American sociologists use. Many European sociologists will actually argue that American sociologists are psychologists in disguise because we're so focused on individuals. And that focus on individuals comes from Max Weber. Max Weber argued against Marx, against Durkheim, that despite the appearance of any sort of group-like nature, we don't have social groups. We have individuals who are engaged in social action. So for Weber, there were no such thing as large-scale social groups. They were just individuals who were engaged in collective patterns of action. Weber, Weber worried about the dangers of reification in sociology. Weber worried that we would become so focused on our ideas that we had about the social world that we would start to mistake these ideas for reality itself. Weber thought when we focus on holistic concepts, we risk mistaking the map for the territory. Right? He saw that as the dangers of reification. And he, Weber actually wrote that the organismic analogy was the quintessential example of a dangerous reification. Weber also argued that the goal of sociology should be verstehen. The goal of sociology should be understanding. Rather than developing these elaborate causal theories of society, Weber himself didn't believe in any sort of social laws, didn't believe that any laws of history were possible. Rather than focus on trying to develop something that he thought was impossible, 
Weber said we should really focus on understanding the motives which underlie social actions. For sociologists of the 20th century, what good could this organismic analogy do if our goal was to understand the motivations of individual social actors? And then lastly, Weber implored sociologists to do a value-free sociology. For Weber, when values were mixed with sociology, the only thing that could happen was trouble. And so Weber said we should focus on developing value-free concepts. Well, the organismic analogy, its association with functionalism, its association with social Darwinism, its association with the forever maligned Herbert Spencer, really demonstrated to sociologists that there was too much baggage associated with the organismic analogy for it to be useful in a value-free science. Many sociologists of the 20th century thought the organismic analogy was really just a fancy metaphor for justifying a status quo where powerful states were able to oppress less powerful states. And so with the influence of, of Weber and Marx, the organismic analogy fell almost completely out of sociological theory. And as I've mentioned again and again, if you take a sociology class now, you'll have just a tiny portion of that class be dedicated to the organismic analogy, even though this analogy was one of the founding backbones of the discipline. And so with that, with that brief history of the organismic analogy, I want to take some time to think about how we could try to redo the organismic analogy. And so with my dissertation research, I was trying to, to learn more about organisms to better understand how a society might or might not be like an organism. And I realized that our understanding of organisms, or I should say the understanding of organisms produced by biologists, is something that rapidly changed during the later parts of the 20th century and the early parts of the 21st century. Right, so if I want to revive the organismic analogy, I'm going to start by asking, what is an organism? And that might seem straightforward. Right? We're all organisms. A dog, that's an organism. A tree, that's an organism. Right? But it's actually much more complicated than that. Biologists have recognized that we have this paradigm of the classical organism, and the defining features of the classical organism have many cases in biology which violate those features. Right? So think about what makes you, you as an organism. One thing that distinguishes organisms from each other is their genetic uniqueness. Right? You have a different genome than I do, than you do, than you do, than the trees outside do. Well, clonal organisms violate this idea of genetic uniqueness. Any organism that reproduces asexually violates this tenet of genetic uniqueness. In many cases, a field of dandelions might be complete genetic relatives, right? Or a swarm of aphids might be complete genetic, identically related. And so the principle of genetic uniqueness is violated by clonal organisms. Another thing that we believed defined us as organisms was genetic homogeneity, right? I only have one genome, and I only have genes from one genome. Well, that criteria of genetic homogeneity is violated by genetic chimeras. It's also violated by many plant species, right? So humans, we have a separate germline from our, our somatic cells. Right? We have a special set of cells that have been sequestered in our reproductive organs, and those are the genes that go on into the, the next generation. So any genetic variation that you acquire through your life, any genetic mutations that your somatic cells you acquire through your life, you don't pass on to your offspring because those genes that you passed on were sequestered in your germline early on in development. And so for large organisms that have a sequestered germline like humans, this criteria of genetic homogeneity applies. But many, many other organisms don't have a separate germline. And so that criteria of genetic homogeneity is violated. The last two defining features of organisms are their physiological unity and their functional autonomy. We expect an organism to be connected to each other. Right? We expect an organism to be of one body. And we also expect organisms to act independently in their environment to survive. But if we accept that eusocial insects 
can be considered as organisms, as many biologists do, then we have to admit that these principles of physical, physiological unity and functional autonomy are violated. Right? Think about yourself even as an organism. We all are symbiotic organisms. We all survive because of the symbiotic bacteria that is in part of our gut. So you as an individual depend on your relationship with different species of bacteria. Without those bacteria, we would be sick and we would not be able to survive. In the same way, you social insect societies have sterile reproductive castes. And so being able to reproduce yourself is part of being functionally autonomous, then any sort of species that has sterile reproductive caste has, has individuals in that species who are not functionally autonomous. And so when we start to look at some of the defining features of organisms, we see that the idea that sociologists had about organisms in the early 20th century or the late 19th century has been completely upended by these cases that violate the classical organism. This recognition of the defining features of organisms has also been upset by what's known as the major transitions in evolution. And so not only do organisms exist, organisms have emerged through an evolutionary process. And so what is a major transition in evolution? Well, the exact number of transitions has been disputed, but periodically through the, the, through the history of life, entities that were separate have came together, been locked into webs of cooperation, and have formed a new, more complex entity. Right? Think about your body. Your body is a, is a collection of cells. You're a multicellular organism. Multicellular organisms haven't always existed through the history of life. Multicellular organisms evolved as different selection pressures pushed unicellular organisms together. And so throughout the history of life on Earth, there's been a process where because of the pressures of evolution, new levels of biological complexity have emerged. What are some major transitions? One of the first major transitions was the transition from genes to cells enclosed in genomes. We have to transition from separate unicells to a symbiotic unicell, right, from prokaryotic cells to eukaryotic cells. We have the transition from unicellular organisms to multicellular organisms. And we can even recognize the transition from multicellular organisms to eusocial societies. And so periodically, through the history of life on Earth, new levels of biological complexity have evolved. What's important for our understanding of organisms is that entities at each level have the coherence of organisms. Entities at each level of this biological hierarchy have the coherence that we would attribute to organisms. And so what the major transitions in evolution has demonstrated to biologists is that rather than organisms being kind of a unique biological phenomenon, we can think of organisms, or what some biologists call evolutionary individuals, existing among multiple levels of complexity. And so the fact that our classical understanding of organisms is violated by a number of biological species, and the fact that we can recognize organisms existing at different levels of complexity, really has highlighted the need for biologists to develop a new, more evolutionarily informed understanding of what makes an organism an organism. And so for my dissertation, I probably had to read more philosophy of biology than I ever bargained for. Right? But with my dissertation, I started to, to look at some new theories that biologists had proposed to define organisms. Perhaps the, the most influential theory for my dissertation was a theory proposed by two biologists, Keller and Strassman, who say that organisms, when we think about Think about the vast biodiversity that exists on Earth. Organisms really don't exist as a matter of kind. They exist as a matter of degree. When we look at the, the vast realm of biodiversity, we see that the world can't be divided between organisms and non-organisms. We have varying degrees of what, what they call organismality. If organisms have certain properties, there are certain entities that, that more faithfully represent those properties than do other entities. And so one recognition that Keller and Strassman had is that organisms exist as a matter of degree. And so this really reorients the conversation in terms of the organismic analogy and sociology.
Because rather than fight about whether a society is or isn't an organism, we can start to talk about the organismality of societies. Right? That some societies will have a higher degree of organismality, whatever that is, than other societies. Right? So what is an organism for Keller and Strassman? Well, they say when you recognize that we're all a collection of lower level parts that are working together to produce the survival of the whole, we can recognize that an organism is a collection of entities that feature an enormously high level of cooperation and a minimal level of conflict. Right? An organism is a collection of cells that are working together. What's, what does this arrangement do? Well, the high level of cooperation and the low level of conflict allows adaptations to function for the benefit of the organism, not for the benefit of those parts. Right? So when your cells are doing what they do, they're working for the benefit of you as a multicellular organism, they're not working for the benefit of themselves. When cells start to work for the benefit of themselves, it's dangerous to the organism. That's the basis of many forms of cancer. And so an organism is a collection of parts that have a high level of cooperation and a low level of conflict. And by having a high level of cooperation and a low level of conflict, it allows design features of the organism to function for the benefit of the organism rather than for the benefit of the parts. And so we can start to apply that definition of organisms to societies. And when we do that, we can come up with this map of organisms that's been produced by Keller and Strassman. This ch chart here is a, a map of, of cells that they would consider more or less organismic. As you move towards the upper right quadrant, these are more organismic entities. These are less organismic entities. Here we have... Uh, cooperation and conflict in groups of multicellular individuals, same dynamic applies. Right? When we recognize that organisms are defined by their level of cooperation and conflict, we can start to map that cooperation and conflict to see what entities have a higher degree of organismality. But what happens, what do you see, does anybody see human societies up there, human bands? Well, according to Keller and Strassman, human societies have way too much conflict to be considered organisms. And this is kind of the standard biological approach. This is kind of the standard biological assumption. And this is why I really thought sociologists need to get into the mix, need to talk about the organismic analogy. For Keller and Strassman, there is just way too much conflict in a society for a society to function as an organism. But I think the, that idea is betrayed, no offense to Keller and Strassman, by their lack of knowledge about social institutions. Right? And so let's think about the conflict that exists in human society and how that conflict might disrupt the overall functioning of the social organism. Well, if we look at Keller and Strassman's own reasoning, we don't have to reject that human societies are organisms because there's too much conflict, because they admit there can be lots of conflict in an organism amongst the parts. But if that organism has mechanisms to regulate that conflict, so that the conflict does not destroy the overall functioning of the organism, that conflict doesn't disqualify that entity from being considered organism. And to make this case, they highlight the existence of transposable elements in the genomes of multicellular organisms. And so what's a transposable element? It's a specific type of genetic material that can bias the genetic process in its own favor against the rest of the genes in the genome. And so you can see here an example of one type of transposable element. This is a transposon that can snip itself out of the genome and reinsert itself at another place. What does this do? This biases transcription in favor of those transposable genes. Right? And so if we're thinking about genes or a genome as a cooperative network of genes, these transposable elements are free riders. How common are they? It turns out they're very common. When we look at the genetic material of organisms, we see a very high frequency of transposable elements. And those transposable elements have been implicated in certain forms of human cancer. And so those transposable elements can disrupt the functioning of the genome. But would any of us question our own organismality because of these jumping genes, as they're called? No. That's because organisms have evolved mechanisms to suppress that conflict. 
right? And so the presence of transposable elements doesn't disqualify mammals from being considered organisms because mammals have evolved mechanisms to regulate that conflict before that conflict can disrupt functioning at the level of the organism. I would argue that in much the same way, societies have evolved institutional mechanisms that work to regulate conflict before that conflict can be disruptive at the societal level. And so let's think about the conflict that exists in human society, and let's think about how this conflict may or may not disrupt the functioning of the larger social organism. To do that, we have to think about what is a societal adaptation, right? Keller and Strassman say that the, the cooperation and conflict manifested in an organism is important for maintaining adaptations at the level of the organism. Well, what is an adaptation at the level of society? To do that, I dug into the literature on the physiology of animal structures. There's a biologist named J. Scott Turner who argues that organisms are transient pools of low entropy. He argues that organisms are essentially these temporary collections of high order. How are organisms able to maintain that transient pool of high order? Well, we have mechanisms that allow us to take in energy from the environment and use that energy for the persistence of the organism. So for J. Scott Turner, an adaptation is a physiological structure or a behavioral structure that has emerged through the process of evolution that allows an organism to take in the energy it needs to persist. So if we apply that definition to society, I say that a social adaptation could be any sort of social structure that allows the social organism to take in the energy it needs from its environment to further its persistence. So if you accept that we can say a social, a societal adaptation is any sort of social structure that maintains the ability of an organism to produce energy in its environment and distribute energy to the members in society who need to consume that energy, then we can say that societies do have adaptations. And in many cases of social conflict, the social conflict does not disrupt those social level adaptations. Right? So there is a lot of conflict in society, but this conflict, more often than not, manifests at the level of individuals. And so conflict in society can be disastrous for the individuals in society. But oftentimes the conflict that exists in society does not bubble up to the surface to destroy the overall social adaptations. Right? Of course, there are conflicts that can disrupt that overall societal functioning. Right? Civil wars, foreign conquest, extreme resource depletion, those are conflicts that can emerge that disrupt the overall social level functioning. But the average level of social conflict, while being devastating for individuals, I would argue does not disrupt the overall functioning of the larger society. Right? Even when there's a, a heinous act of violence that occurs, that heinous act of violence oftentimes does not disrupt the energy producing mechanisms, the energy distribution mechanisms of the larger society. Right? And so while it's cer certainly possible to have social conflicts that disrupt the, the energy capacity of a society, I would argue that in more cases than not, the violence that exists, the conflict that exists, exists at the level of individuals and doesn't disrupt the overall functioning of society. Moreover, while we might have a civil war that tears the society apart, organisms do get sick and die. Organisms do uh, suffer from cancer. We wouldn't discount the organismality of a human being because we can get sick and die from that illness. And so I don't think we should automatically disqualify societies from being considered organisms simply because there can be disruptive social conflict when we actually have an elaborate set of social institutions that work to regulate this conflict to keep that conflict from disrupting the larger social functioning. Right? We have informal systems of norms and sanctions. We have legal codes. We have systems of religious belief. And all of these institutions work to regulate conflict before it can become disruptive for the larger social system. And so we can start to see that maybe societies do have many of the characteristics of organisms. Right? If entities that have high levels of organismality are entities that have mechanisms which foster cooperation and that regulate conflict, 
so that the component parts of the organism can work together to take in energy from the environment, well then to the extent that a society has mechanisms for producing cooperation and regulating conflict, which enable that society to, per to persist by taking in energy from its environment, then we can consider that society to be an organism, to, to, ex to be exhibiting of some level of organismality. Moreover, we can say that the organismality of a society may vary over time depending on the function of those institutions. And different societies may themselves exhibit different degrees of organismality. And so when we recognize that organisms are these collective entities that have mechanisms for promoting cooperation and for regulating conflict, and that this allows adaptations at the level of the organism, we can start to think that maybe, yeah, human society can exhibit some level of organismality due to the fact that we do have social institutions that encourage cooperation. We do have social institutions that regulate conflict, and this allows our societies to produce and distribute the energy that's necessary for their larger social persistence. And so with this redefinition of organisms, we can start to make the case that societies can and do oftentimes exhibit a high degree of organismality. And there's one more piece of the puzzle that we can use to support this notion of the social organism. And so organisms don't just come out of nothing. Organisms don't just emerge from thin air. Organisms emerge through this evolutionary process. If an organism is a coherent collection of lower level entities that's bound together through a web of cooperation and, and minimal conflict, well then we can try to, to recognize a process by which organisms emerge, an evolu a set of evolutionary stages through which a, a collection of entities must pass through to become an organism. There's an evolutionary biologist named Andrew Bork who studied the emergence of multicellular organisms and studied the emergence of eusocial societies, and he's argued that there's this three-step process that a collection of entities must pass through to become a higher level organism. Right? First is social group formation, next comes social group maintenance, and finally comes a process of social group transformation. If societies can be considered organisms, as I try to reason that they can, we should see this set of three stages play out when we look at the long scale of human societal evolution. Right? If human societies do represent entities that have a high degree of organismality, when we look at human evolution and human societal evolution, we should see a process organized around group formation, a process around, organized around group maintenance, and finally a process organized around social group transformation. I argue when you look at the long scale of human history, this is exactly what you see, this is exactly what you find. And so first, looking at social group formation, social group formation is the first step of the process. It's that process where a group of separate entities starts to aggregate together. Social group formation happens when ecological factors, such as predation or resource depletion, or when synergistic factors, such as the benefit of a division of labor, or when genetic factors, um, such as potential relationships between kin, create a situation where increasing cooperation is favored amongst a diverse group of entities. When we look at the long scale of human evolution, I argue that a, this social group, this period of social group formation was a period that lasted from about seven million years ago from the divergence of humans and chimpanzees from our last common ancestor until about two million years ago. And so when we look at, at what was happening during this time period, we find that the the last common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees was likely a slow and a loud primate. When we look at the skeletal features of, of species such as Artipithecus, we see that they had started to, to walk bipedally, but they weren't very efficient at it, so they were relatively slow. They had lo lost many of their adaptations for climbing, so they were becoming slow climbers. And uh, non-human primates tend to lack some of the cortical control that human primates do of our emotional responses, and so this early last common ancestor was likely to be loud. Well, during this million year time period, there was changes to the climate, which overall led to increasing variation um, in, in climate patterns, in terms of rainfall, in terms of the distribution of woodland um, compared to grasslands, compared to forestlands. 
And so there was increasing variability and increasing risk of predation during this time period. And so these factors would have created ecological and synergistic pressures encouraging a more solitary primate, primate to come together into social groups. By about two million years ago, many paleontologists assume that we had already developed a social system based on cooperative breeding and cooperative hunting. This is a time period when we reason that there'd be increasing pressures from predation, but human development was slowing down. We can tell from fossil evidence that, that from Australopithecus to Homo erectus, human development had been slowing and human brains had been growing. If human development had been slowing and brains had been growing, that suggests that humans were getting better at finding food and humans were getting better at keeping each other safe. Right? Many paleoanthropologists believe that by the appearance of Homo erectus, we were likely engaged in cooperative breeding. And what I mean by cooperative breeding is alloparental care. That means that more than just the, mo the mother and father unit would be provisioning resources for young. Uh, there's many biologists that actually think the first appearance of grandparents, the first appearance of, of humans living a long period uh, in post-reproductive life would be during this time period. Right? So we, can, we have some fossil evidence that suggests there were increasing pressures for group formation during this time period from about 7 million to 2 million years ago. Well, the next step in the transition is the period of social group maintenance. And once groups have formed, once separate individuals have come together and started to work cooperatively, well, now there is a benefit for anybody who's a free rider. Right? If you're in a cooperative group, you can get more than you put in by becoming a free rider. And so groups have to develop mechanisms for protecting against exploitation from both within the group and from without of the group. I would argue that this, is, this transition of social group maintenance was also happening from about 7 million years ago to about 50,000 years ago. We see that during this time period, uh, hominins developed what we believe to be an elaborate in-group psychology, and we really see the more monumentous change humans started to evolve an extensive palette of self-conscious emotions. Self-conscious emotions are emotions that are special. They're emotions that are unique. They're not emotions such as anger that just automatically emerge when our goals have been frustrated. Self-conscious emotions are emotions that are self-referential. When you feel embarrassment, that feeling of embarrassment is a feeling that reflects your own experience in that social environment. This is important because self-conscious emotions provide a low-cost sanctioning system for us to punish free riders. There was a lot of, of research and studies, uh, and evolutionary studies of human behavior that said when humans have the opportunity to punish each other, we can use punishments to keep free riding down. But subsequent research has shown that humans actually are not as motivated to punish each other for norm violations as early research, uh, as early research made us believe. Why? It's because when you punish somebody, they're going to retaliate, retaliate, or they might retaliate. If other people have the opportunity to retaliate, you're not likely to punish. And so punishment is important for limiting, limiting exploitation from free riders within the group. Self-conscious emotions are a very low-cost, efficient punishing system. You don't need to actually physically punish somebody. You can use a larger collective to invoke a sense of embarrassment in somebody. And that emotion itself will motivate future normative compliance. And so humans exhibit self-conscious emotions. Neuroscientists have looked at the reorganization of the human brain throughout evolutionary history. And they believe that this palette of self-conscious emotions evolved um, during this time period. And so these self-conscious emotions are important for a low-cost punishing system to limit free riding. It's also during this time period that we develop projectile weapon technology. One of the things that really distinguishes human primates from non-human primates is that we can throw really hard. Even a, a human that doesn't have a good arm can throw way harder than most non-human primates. And this is important because it allows for coalitional punishment. What happens in a world prior to projectile weapon technology well, if you're going to physically punish somebody, you have to do it in close hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's really dangerous, and you might not want to do it. 
Well, with projectile weapons, you can have a group of weaker people take out one relatively strong individual while they're standing back and using those projectiles. And so projectile weapon technology, I believe the first stone tip spear that we have evidence of is about 250,000, 300,000 years old. Projectile weapon technology is a, a new invention that allowed us to decrease exploitation from free riders. You don't have to be strong enough to beat somebody up. All you need is a group of people who can hurl rocks at the offender from the safety of a distance. And so it's during this time period that we saw increasing technological sophistication and increasing emotional sophistication that would allow for, for the minimization of exploitation from free riders. The last step is social group transformation. And in social group transformation, this collection of separate entities becomes linked together into a cohesive whole. Right? For Andrew F. G. Bork, he's, he proposes the size complexity hypothesis. He argues that when, through the dynamics of the group, a relationship emerges where increases in group size produce more complex divisions of labor, which enable further increases in group size, that feedback relationship between increasing size, increasing complexity of the division of labor will transform a collection of separate entities into a coherent social unit. So the final step in the transition from a collection of lower level entities to the emergence of a higher level organism for Bork is the size complexity hypothesis. That when there becomes a positive feedback relationship between group size and the complexity of the division of labor, that group will transform into a cohesive whole. Right? When we look at the transformation of the human societal organism, this is exactly the dynamic that we see with the emergence of agriculture. And this is actually the dynamic that Durkheim highlighted in his division of labor. Right? So I argue that the transformation of the human societal organism started about 12,000 years ago as changes in the climate after the last glacial ma maximum um, allowed populations of foragers to become more sedentary, enabling the eventual emergence of agriculture. Well, with the emergence of agriculture, I would argue that society has been thrown into the size complexity feedback relationship where increasing size of agricultural societies necessitated increasing complexity of the divisions of labor of those societies, which allowed for even further increases in size. And so I argue that agriculture initiated this size complexity feedback relationship and that relationship was even intensified by industrialization. You might be wondering, um, is there any sociological theorizing past Durkheim that recognized the existence of this size complexity feedback relationship? One of my advisors at UCR, Dr. Christopher Chase Dunn, um, is responsible for developing what he calls the iteration model of world systems development. And for world systems theorists, this model connects increasing size to increasing population pressure, to increasing complexity of society. And so as world systems theorists have, have uncovered this size complexity feedback relationship, I argue that this dynamic highlighted by world systems theorists is the size complexity feedback dynamic that's been responsible for taking human society from that simple organismic state and transitioning it into a more complex coherent organism. And so you can see here just some elements of the model. Increasing population size lead to increasing intensification of subsistence. You have more mouths to feed. You have to produce more food. Well, as you're producing more food, it degrades the environment. It makes it harder to support that same amount of population. When the land isn't full, oftentimes people will emigrate to, to new lands. If those lands are circumscribed, it can oftentimes lead to warfare, lead to conflict. Or through population pressure, it can directly lead to the formation of hierarchies and the development of different technologies, um, both in the division of labor and more mechanical technologies, which further enable increases in population size, starting the whole dynamic over again. So to the extent that this relationship that world systems theorists have uncovered is true, I argue that this is the size fe feedback complexity relationship that was necessary for taking the simple societal organisms of that agricultural era and moving them into the more complex social cultural organisms that we see currently. And so with that justification that societies do exhibit high levels of cooperation, we have mechanisms for regulating conflict, 
that allow societies to persist, that allow societies to take in the energy that we need to survive. And as societies, I think, can, can be argued to have passed through those three stages, I argue that it's completely justified to consider societies as organisms. Right? Not all societies will be organismic, but some societies will have a higher degree of organismality than others. And I argue um, throughout my dissertation, this will be more for maybe a, a philosophy club lecture in the spring, I argue that from the era of foraging societies through the era of agricultural civilizations to the era of global civilizations, the general level of organismality has increased as we have elaborated institutions for encouraging cooperation and elaborated institutions for, for regulating any conflict that might exist within the social organism. All right, so with that, I'll leave that up there, and I want to open up the floor for any questions, any commentary, uh, any, any points of clarification that, that you would like me to touch on. Yes? Um, I, came in, I came in late, so I missed the first five, five minutes. Mm -hmm. Do you teach? Do you, do you teach? Yes. Do you yeah, I'm a, I am a sociology professor right here at Cerritos. Oh, okay. okay. Yes? Doesn't weather have a lot to do with how societies are created? Yeah, and I think that uh, the, the climate definitely produces kind of the background factors that act as those selection pressures, right? So one of the, when we're talking about social group formation, Andrew Bork highlights how ecological factors are often the first set of factors that will push a group of separately living entities to come together. Right? And so as the, as the climate changed um, in the end of the Miocene and, the, and through the Pliocene, we would have seen increasing variability in the, the home ranges of, of early hominid species. And that increasing variability in the home ranges would have been one of those ecological factors that would have, would have encouraged further group formation. Yeah, and so the, the background weather conditions play kind of a key role in producing those uh, selection pressures for group formation in the first place, yeah. Yes? Um, just like organisms, living organisms uh, evolve like you were saying, mm -hmm. uh, and right now currently following your argument, uh, is there another step to the evolution process for societal organisms? Or are we going to move past where we're currently at? Or is this just a continuous stage that we're going to stay in? Yeah, that's a, 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 a really good question. Because when you look at the way I present this here, I argue we go from you know, foraging organisms to an agricultural organisms to a global social organism, right? As we have increases in kind of a globalized division of labor, um, globalized networks of exchange. We have interna international peacekeeping keeping efforts which have reduced the prevalence of civil wars around the globe, right? And so, so you might forecast um, kind of an increasing global organism, right? You might forecast organismality increasing at the global level. But one thing I want to highlight is I don't just assume that the organismality of societies is progressing on and upwards forever towards a more organismic state. There can be processes that will temporarily reduce the organismality of a human society. And so whereas it might be reasonable to conclude that the global organism will become mo more coherent in the future, there could be some conflicts that prop up that serve to reduce the functioning of the organism as that, of, on that global level. And maybe there's some larger worldwide conflict that will take us back from a global organism to more localized uh, societal organisms. Yeah, and so you could forecast an increasing progression of organismality, but that isn't inevitable depending on what ends up happening in society. The organismality of societies, I would argue, has progressively increased over time, but it's, had, it's a, a sawtooth progression where there have been fits and starts and ups and downs. I'm not a biologist or anything about stuff. Mm -hmm. Just throwing that out there. But uh, from what I can tell, there isn't any organism that 
background, or that you uh, be evolved, or I don't know what is, is that even the proper term. So if society is able to, you know, you said in the future something might occur where we go back to an agricultural civilization mm -hmm. and, and go back uh, a, a step backward, no other organism that I'm aware of has that same process. So would we still be classified alongside other organisms in the society itself, or is it a different type of organism? Yeah, that's a, 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 a really good point to the, the extent that we can have a reduction in the organismic capacity of human societies. Um, to what extent does that, does that um, disqualify or maybe make human societies a different type of organism? And that's something that we really might not be able to answer uh, because a lot of the input that was developed f by Queller and Strassman has been by researching the transition from unicellular forms to multicellular forms. Um, and so that's a transition that happened millions of years ago that we can't really observe in present time. We can just observe differences in the structure and function of multicellular forms of, uh, say, bulbocene algae. That's been a really important uh, species for trying to understand the emergence of multicellularity with this, this algae. We know that there are unicellular forms. There are simple multicellular forms and there are more complex multicellular forms. So in comparing those unicellular to more simple to more complex multicellular forms, we've developed a theory for how that transition must have taken place. But since that transition took place hundreds of millions of years ago, we weren't able to observe kind of any fits and starts that might have, that might have, uh, might have occurred. And so, yeah, the idea that a human societal organism can go backwards might be a, a little asterisk that has to be uh, appended to the notion of the societal organism that maybe this is a unique property of so societal organisms, but it could be too that our understanding of those transitions from unicellularity to multicellularity or from multicellular societies to use social societies was a process that also involved some fits and starts, um, but it happened too far ago for us to really observe those. Yeah, so that's really a, a, a great kind of point of future research in, form, in terms of uh, just how organismic are human societies. Good point. In the back. Uh, Matt, I want to bring back Marx mm -hmm. into this discussion. There's a number of scholars who have tried to recover in capital Marx's great economic mm -hmm. uh, masterpiece. Um, the idea of the concept of what they call a metabolic rift mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. fossil capitalism has introduced into the relationship between human societies and the conditions that sustain any human society on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of people like John Bellamy Foster, Andreas Malm, um, uh, Jason Moore, who want to talk about capitalism disrupting mm -hmm. the very conditions of life and what's needed as we enter into this you know, ongoing crisis uh, 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 internally to capitalism, the rise of cap class conflict, mm -hmm. the rise of freeloaders in power, the 1% who exploit the labor of those who increasingly are stressed out, or disillusioned, or alienated, or frustrated in various ways. Um, but there's, 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 at this very fundamental level, a rift that can only be overcome by replacing capitalism itself mm -hmm. as a complex social organism. So they talk about a bio or ecological basis for socialism. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if you're aware of this mm -hmm. literature, so I, I, I think what you're saying is really uh, interesting in, in a generic sociological sense, mm -hmm. but in a more specific historical sense, uh, it's capitalism that's disrupting the conditions of life on this planet, and capitalism has to be replaced mm -hmm. in a higher, uh, uh, more robust kind of democratic society called liberal socialism. Mm -hmm. you and the, weigh and in on that, or um, kind of yeah. So kind of that uh, that that process of social upheaval, right, that's central to Marx's theorizing, I think really highlights an important dynamic about the organismality of human societies, is that as you point out with capitalism, um, due to the way the current economic situation is, it creates a lot of benefit for a small segment of people and a lot of misery for a much larger segment of people. Um, one thing that I think is, is important to keep in mind is that a more organismic society might not necessarily be good 
from the standpoint of individuals within that society. And so a society that can function at a more organismic level, a society that can take in more energy and distribute more energy might be functioning more coherently at the level of the system, but from the level of the individual, that system might be felt as, as oppressive or as exploitive or as not beneficial for the individual. And so that's really something that I struggled with in trying to, to think about this organismic analogy is trying to highlight the fact or understand the fact that a more organismic society might be good from the perspective of the organismic society, but from the perspective of the individuals who are part of that organism, it might not be the best case scenario. Right? We might actually, from an individual perspective, fare better in a society with a lower degree of organismality, depending on the, the nature of the institutions that, that regulate uh, cooperation and conflict. And so I think that's a really good point in that, that one area I'm still trying to really wrap my mind around is the relationship between the individual's experience of society and how that vibes with the, the, the level of the social organism. I think there's two. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of one percenters, but isn't, isn't a, a partial definition of, of, um, of um, is it doesn't cap isn't capitalism the partial definition a reflection of human energy? Well, so I think the uh, a capitalist economic system has certainly made human or allowed human societies to harvest more energy from the environment. Um, when you look at the energy that's used in kind of the core areas of the social organism, you can see that, well, I define the complex societal organism as any area where the core areas were, were using about 50,000 calories of energy per capita per day. But in, in uh, society like American society, I know it's estimated that the average American uses about upwards of 200,000. I wasn't referring to physical energy, but mental energy. Capitalism mm -hmm. being a reflection of mental energy. Yeah, yeah. And so there is a, a kind of an institutional logic that goes on to reproducing that capitalist system, right? And so the institutional logics that are a part of the system are really one of those key features in motivating cooperation or in regulating conflict. Do we have a question? <clears throat> question I guess I wrote down was is there some sort of like objective endpoint for this organism like what we talk about in class like Plato's form mm -hmm. like, as a form of objectivism mm -hmm. where it's like we're trying to move towards this with like the knowledge of kind of past lives or whatever so for society the more complex it gets are we trying to move towards like the perfect society in a sort of way or is it like you can't really know because there's no really, like perfect organism right? like there's no like, human or yeah it can never really be a perfect society right? Yeah, I think, I mean, there certainly would be sociologists that, that use the organismic analogy in more of the formal way. And I think that was one of the problems with the early organismic analogy is that somebody like Comte or like Spencer thought that we could look at how the organism was progressing towards a, a better, more ideal state based on the way the institutions were changing. Um, so I think early on in sociology, there would have been many sociologists that had that idea of the social organism, that there was some endpoint, there was some kind of utopian point that the organism would evolve to that it would reach. But I think a, a more up-to-date understanding of the evolution of the societal organism would, would vibe more with your latter point in that we don't know, you know what is a perfect organism. Right, we have biologists will talk about what about paradigm organisms. Right, so a, a mammal we consider ourselves to be paradigm organisms, um, but there is no real tried and true single definition of what an organism is. As that that focus on the major transi transitions in evolution has shown, we can see organisms that existing upon multiple levels. And so I think uh, the way I like to think about the organismic analogy is that this is an evolutionary process and it'll happen the way that those evolutionary dynamics take it. Yeah. Um, piggybacking off of what uh, Omar said, can there be, um, I don't know if you're familiar with philosophy, maybe the professors could uh, jump in on this, but mm -hmm. the, it's in, 
It sounds very reminiscent of what uh, some ancient Greeks would talk about. I'm not mistaken. If I'm not mistaken, maybe Heraclitus was talking about the interconnectedness mm -hmm. of uh, like the universe and mm -hmm. uh, patterns. And, uh, maybe this has been touched, you know, in the ancient times as well. Maybe not as elaborate as you have explained it, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe there is some reminiscence of, this, of ancient Greek philosophy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think it, that's a, that uh, I 100 percent agree with that. I think that was one one. Um, if you go back to the first slide where I was talking about neomania and the Lindy effect, that was one thing that I think really justifies studying the organismic analogy. Is that not only is the organismic analogy go back to the founding of the discipline of sociology, it goes back thousands of years to more ancient ideas, right? In uh, Marx's notebooks. This is where I first started to get the idea. He has a little, fo a little footnote um, in the beginning of his notebooks where he talks about the, organism the idea of the social body being used to motivate uh, the end of some rebellion uh, in, the, in ancient Rome. Yeah, and so this idea that, uh, that we have a social body, that a society can be a body, I think is definitely older than just sociology and really perhaps goes back uh, thousands of years which for me highlights its staying power, right? If we had these ideas thousands of years ago, probably thousands of years in the future, we'll still be debating whether or not a society is an organism, and we'll maybe be debating my idea of organismality. Right? Yeah? Uh, another question I had was, um, you mentioned that the organism How would we define those in this sort of like system of or, or organisms for a society? Like, would they be a bacteria, a disease, something that harms the organism in total? Is it like an antibody that comes in and saves the organism? Like, are the definitions for that is that kind of like how you want to categorize them eventually, or we kind of like don't want to touch on that? Yeah, so that's a that's a really good point because one way that the organismic analogy uh, went to its downfall was that some other sociologists, Rene Worms, Albert Schaeffel they really started to take the metaphor very seriously and try to analogize this part of society would be like the brain of an organism. This part of society would be like the bacteria of an organism. And so one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to try to, to stay away from thinking about, okay, well, the distribution system is like the blood vessels of the society. And that's why when I look up here, I said if an organism is defined by cooperation and conflict, we can look at institutions that motivate conflict, or institutions that regulate conflict, and institutions that motivate cooperation. And so to the extent that some sort of ideology um, motivated exchange in society, I'd say we could consider that a technology of distribution. It's a technology that encourages cooperation. But the idea uh, regulated conflict, or maybe if the idea even led to more conflict in society, we want to reflect on how it fits into these technologies of power. And so one way I tried to, to keep myself from going astray was instead of thinking about what each part of society might be in terms of the organism, to try to think about how different institutions might either motivate cooperation or, or discourage conflict in society. So it's more like a results-based sort of thing. Yeah. It's like after you see what does to the society, then you're like, okay, so this or this. Yeah. Okay. I think we uh, run out of time. So uh, we've been this organist, organistic uh, conversation, and uh, maybe continue. Say, uh, awesome. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for having me here. If anybody was interested in some of the ideas that kind of went into this, uh, these are the works in evolutionary theory and sociological theory that were really monumental uh, in, in helping me build up this theory. So if you want to read any more about this, uh, definitely check out some of these works. And thank you all for the opportunity and for being here.